So welcome to Angels Don't Lie. I'm really excited to be here with you tonight. And my beautiful, amazing guest, Katie, is here. Hi, Katie. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? I'm okay. Katie, you've had a roller coaster of, of a life. <laughs> of a life. It's not even just recently. <laughs> There's no subtle way of putting that. Why don't I let you just like introduce yourself and tell them like who you are? Sure. Um, so my name is Katie. Um, I'm 33 and uh, I, um, I'm, my family is myself, uh, my husband, Jonathan, and we have two children, uh, Brayden, who is two and a half. He'll be three in November. I'm really sad about that. And uh, Penelope, who is 14 months. And uh, Braden has a few medical complexities. He has uh, cerebral palsy, spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy, um, agenesis of the corpus callosum. Um, he was born without uh, ACLs or kneecaps. And, uh, um, you know, he's a tough cookie. And Penny is our little miracle spitfire. Uh, she was quite the surprise. And, um, uh, my husband, uh, Jonathan and I, uh, have been married for, uh, seven years and unfortunately he passed away, um, due to complications of COVID-19 in April. So I'm kind of figuring this all out. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, um, young, really newlywed family, you know, I, I always consider people under the 10 year mark kind of like still getting it together and figuring it out and then having you know your journey through even having a child that was a big journey and katie has joined me on angels don't lie before we we've actually um had a previous interview because we worked together um through some really <laughs> yeah we go way back um through the challenges after Braden was born because um, when he was born, while you were pregnant, you were actually told that he had a life-threatening illness, right? Yeah, so um, to go back a little bit, uh, Jonathan and I, unfortunately, um, had two uh, pretty hard miscarriages prior to uh, getting pregnant with Brayden, and we ended up... Uh, going through IVF to conceive Brayden and uh, IVF, anyone who's gone through IVF knows it's an emotionally taxing process and physically it's, it's, you have to be a pretty tough cookie and a tough couple or a tough human being to go through IVF. And we were very lucky to get pregnant with Brayden on our first round of IVF. And uh, at 20 weeks, they noticed uh, Brayden had a uh, abnormality in his kneecap where his knee, his right knee looked as if it was completely turned around facing as if it was be facing the wall. And we did genetic testing, we did all of that, and it came back normal. And we had week, um, every two weeks, we had ultrasounds just to keep an eye on things. And at 32 weeks pregnant, they noticed he had some fluid on the back of his brain. So they thought it could possibly be hydrocephalus which is amount of fluid buildup in the brain because you're it's producing too much. And so they sent me for a fetal MRI. And that night we got the phone call that Brayden originally had the diagnosis of something called lysencephaly, which is an extremely rare, pretty devastating neurological condition. And they prepared us that he was not going to survive birth. So Jonathan and I had to make plans for what our path was going to be if Brayden was born alive, one, and two, if he was going to survive birth. But kids a lot tougher than most adults. So two and a half years later, <laughs> he's here. Yeah, so there's been some, you had some miracles along the way. For sure. But even the journey for you and Jonathan to come together as a couple, like yeah. that was like, if we like even backtrack to where you were then, like yeah. where I, when I first met you in college, 
you know, um, Katie and my daughter, Lauren were uh, very good friends. Um, and you had gone through a loss of a boyfriend. Yes. So, um, I had dated my college boyfriend, Sean, for about three, three and a half years. And, uh, he started having the last year of our relationship started having pretty significant, um, health issues. He uh, had epilepsy and it just kind of got out of control with other typical things. He was a, he was 22 when he passed away. He was a typical 22 year old, but his body just couldn't handle being a typical 22 year old. So the things that everyone else could do because he had epilepsy and things like that, uh, his body didn't respond very well to and he ended up passing. He um, he ended up passing away from necrotizing pancreatitis. His uh, his pancreas basically um, un- exploded, and uh, he ended up falling in the bathroom, and it cut off his airway. And uh, they did not have a key to get into the bathroom at the dorms. So by the time I got there, they had just taken him out of the bathroom and. He was on uh, life support for uh, about three days, and then we said goodbye. So that would it's going to be 10 years since he passed away in November. One of the first times that we came together to do like a little work together um, with after you had Braden, and Braden was, I think, I think he, was, he was not six months yet, but... Yeah, he was just barely, like, I think probably four or five months. Yeah, and... Um, And Sean had come through in a reading, like he came through for you and showed up some, you know, just kind of showed his, his energy and kind of guided, offered some, some love for you and support for you, what you were going through. And um, just like a reassurance of like how things were going to be for you, which I thought was interesting because we were there just for Brayden. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, exactly. Um, But, you know, I always say like, if we're open, like God has a plan and our loved ones who want to come through will come through if we're just open and uh, you just see what shows up and it's kind of insane. Um, but can you, and I don't know like how far you want to go. Like, do you want to co- go to like, like what happened in April? Like what happened? Like so, um, going uh I guess each we can, I mean, should I talk, I can talk about like, so Jonathan uh, was exposed to COVID uh, the week of, it was close to St. Patrick's day around there. And uh, about, he had found out he had been exposed later that week and he started showing symptoms around the 23rd or 24th of March. And by the 26th, it had gotten pretty scary where he couldn't catch his breath when he was breathing, when he was coughing. And I, I remember he was getting in the shower and he yelled for me and I ran in and he said, look at my hands and his uh, fingers were purple. And um, that obviously is a sign of poor oxygenation. And so we, uh, we, the next morning called his primary care doctor and he said to go to the hospital for ne- some nebulizer treatment and that would be, he would come home and be good to go. And he, uh, he got, I am not, the I don't have a lot of <laughs> answers uh, for what happened. Um, he was, I was never told that Jonathan was intubated um, until Jonathan pulled the tube out and demanded to speak to me. They never allowed him to talk to me prior to him being intubated and a doctor never contacted me. So I really, I don't know, um, unfortunately, much about what happened and how he ended up intubated, but um, it was, it just got pretty bad. And, but then he's made a complete turnaround the last week. We had a, they had switched his team of doctors and the new team of doctors were fantastic. I feel if we had had that team from the beginning, it would be a different situation. 
Um, that team was really wanting to include me in everything, which had not happened um, prior. And we're really in, they were optimistic and reiterated to me, he's, he's going to come home. We're going to be able to take him off the ventilator. And um, I'm not sure why, but a uh, doctor made the call to take him off the ventilator early. And uh, Jonathan went into cardiac arrest as they were trying to reintubate him. And so you were home with the children who had COVID as well. Yeah. So Braden and Penelope both tested positive. Um, I was never tested because it was during the beginning of the pandemic. So there was not a lot of testing available. I don't even know how to make that sound okay. But it was safe to they said it was safe to say that uh, I was positive. And I did have a few talking to people who have had COVID because the only person that I had known who had had COVID had been Jonathan. And obviously I hadn't been able to speak with him. But since then I talked to a few people who have had COVID. And some of the things I just brushed off as like, oh, I was cleaning too much. So my nose was burning from the cleaning things. Um, those were symptoms that other people had. And so it, and Penelope had a low grade fever for a couple days, but was pretty much okay. And Brayden, who we were the most concerned about, was completely asymptomatic. And it's it's crazy to me that our biggest concern was Brayden, and obviously Penelope, but Brayden being, he basically qualified for all of the first original five high risk categories for COVID. Uh, for him to be asymptomatic was insane. And for Jonathan, who we and I, who we were least concerned about for Jonathan to get so sick was just not what we had been, not what we had foreseen if we had gotten COVID. And we did a little bit of work um, while he was, while Jonathan was in the hospital, you know, just helping you, supporting you um, to help you stay centered and focused for your children, which it was, it was a really difficult time. Like, just all around, but you really, from, from the outside of you, from me, like how you handled yourself was so, you were together, like you were falling apart, but you were together. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of my uh, coping mechanisms now in trauma counseling. They want me to try to get rid of this coping mechanism, but mm. um, it's, I've always in times of crisis, when Sean passed away, when we went through the miscarriages, um, if I n know that other people are directly affected, I shut down, but not in a way where I withdraw. I withdraw from people. I just go into this is what I have to do mode. And I was very lucky that my family and Jonathan's family were huge support systems and have been, and I they really helped me so much. But uh, I, I really go into, okay, it's zombie mode where this is what I have to do. This is what I have to get done. And Jonathan didn't marry me because I wasn't a, a strong human being. I might not feel that way all the time. And I might be not together as like, I might appear together, but I'm really not. But I, he always had so much faith in me. And this was the one time that I had to step up for him. And I think that's also part of it. Cause I do feel like I let him down a little bit. No, oh, right. That's, that's that like crazy guilt that we carry when something is out of our control and there was no control. You, you couldn't be there with them. So, you know, you, you did so many interviews afterwards because the interesting thing, the miracle thing is, like, yeah. there, was a, there was a miracle. Like, it's sad and crazy, but yet a miracle because it gave you hope. Do you want to share that? Yeah. So um, just like the, this whole situation doesn't make sense from I, not speaking to Jonathan when he, before he was intubated and then him passing away it was just really crazy and didn't seem real and then uh after I had left him the morning he passed in his phone he had written us a note uh the night before he had been intubated and 
it was basically um, a, a goodbye. Um, it was a goodbye note. And it doesn't make sense because we had been speaking that whole time and I had been contacted by the social worker that day saying that Jonathan was going to be um, released on Monday or that next day. I don't, I think it was, I don't remember, but the next day that he had been doing pretty well, but you know, he was just riding it. He would just ride it out. So there was no indication that he was headed in the direction he was headed. So I don't understand why he wrote the note, but he did write us a note and, um, I, that morning he passed, I shared it on Brayden's Facebook page and I didn't think anything of it. Um, I thought it was kind of crazy that he wrote it, but I, in my grief and delirium, just shared it. And a friend of ours ha is friends with a reporter from BuzzFeed and she asked to do a piece on it and it just blew up in a way that I never saw coming and it was, it was been kind not kind of, it's been extremely crazy. <laughs> and I, you know, I feel like the pieces coming together of what was in that note was, you know, Jonathan saying, I'm going to still take care of you. Right. Yeah, no, that's that I definitely, I mean, I don't think he would have ever had any idea that this was going to be what it was. I think he thought, if anything, it was going to help me not feel, I think when anyone passes away in a tragic situation, the people that you love and are closest to, what they do is, did they know that I love them? Were they upset because I argued with them three weeks ago? You replay all of your conversations. And that's, I've done that regardless, but I think he knew that if he, leaving us that no, I wouldn't look back and doubt if he loved me or if I loved him or if we and it was never the kids the kids he knew and I know that they know how much Jonathan loves them but um I think he knew that I would need some sort of reassurance so I didn't doubt myself and he definitely gave me that but it's definitely turned into something much more which i it's crazy, but I'm really happy that Jonathan is getting as all the accolades for being a, a superb human being and husband because and father because he never gave himself enough credit ever. And now the whole world is giving him credit. So he, he deserves it very much so. And the support that you're receiving and to go forward, like you want to talk a little bit about that, like, I, I can't imagine like what your every day is. Yeah. Um, but you're, what's fueling you to, to keep going. The kids um, that, I mean, I think, and I, I don't say this in a way to sound dramatic or melancholy, but I think if the kids, we didn't have the kids, it would be a different um, situation. Uh, Cause you get, you go to not, good places and I still go to those places but the one thing that keeps me going is what an injustice and how unfair would it be to Jonathan for me to give up and even though I want to I can't because I know that he would want to be he he deserves to be here and he would want to be here so I would be doing the greatest injustice to him if I didn't stay so the kid for the kids, like be the best mom I can be. And that's really my only priority right now is being a good mom and being here for them. And you just shared something and I love, um, you know, following you on your journey for Braden page, because you are such a brilliant writer. Um, you're, you just have a knack, like it's just effortless for you. And, um, <laughs> well, it looks effortless, um, but you just shared, you know, this beautiful, intimate moment with Brayden and his new chair. Can you share, can you share that with the listeners? Because it's really heart touching. The little party? Yes, yes. So, um, 
my uh Braden finally received his wheelchair which you know it's kind of crazy because most parents growing up they're not like one day when my kid gets his wheelchair like that's not what you foresee for yourself but Jonathan and I looked at every single thing with Braden as a soccer game like this is his big moment like we never we always used to say um we would say top five parenting moment and we were so looking forward to getting his Braden getting his wheelchair because he's so ready to be independent and he finally received it. So it was very um, bittersweet day. It's hard. He's not here, but it's so exciting for Braden. And we went to my in-laws uh, and with my sister-in-law, brother-in-law and Oliver, uh, my ne our nephew and uh, Donna and Al, my in-laws bought a cake that says keep on rolling Braden and it was basically Braden got his wheels party and uh they also had shirts made which my mother-in-law just got so we're going to be taking pictures with them this weekend that says like roll in with button mm -hmm. and we call Braden button because he's our buddy Braden and uh it was a very um inclusive party and uh the one thing that i love is my sister-in-law and brother-in-law and my sister and my other brother-in-law our nephews my nephews are the same age they're five and almost five and they have questions they want to know why does Braden eat through his tummy and why does he wear stickers and why does he have a wheelchair and both my sister-in-law and my sister and my brother-in-laws are so into making it a normal thing and my in-laws and my parents and even our friends are so into like, oh, that's just Braden. This is what he does. And I think the world lacks that so much in mm -hmm. so many different ways now that seeing my family really embrace it. And when I say my family, I mean, Jonathan, they're my family. Um, it's, it's so nice. And I mean, our Jonathan and I, we are we used to say we were on Katie and Jonathan Island. And when we had Braden, we, our focus was him and him only. And we were very private. We shared with Braden's Facebook page, we shared um, what we wanted to, but we were very private with everything else. And we really didn't even include our family and friends um, just because it's a lot. When you're a parent of a medically complex child, the highs and lows, the highs are fantastic, but the lows are really, really hard. They're really tough and it's hard on your marriage. It could go one of two ways. It either makes you stronger or it destroys you. Luckily for us, we became stronger. And then you throw in our pleasant little surprise Penelope and you have two kids under the age of two it's and then I had an accident with my hand and it was just the last three years have been absolute chaos for us so we never really allowed our families to be a huge part of what our lives were like and um now be, uh, they have they've become very very much a huge focal point and just making it normal which it should be and it's it's fantastic it's awesome for Braden and it's awesome for our families to kind of just it's just Braden. It's normal for us, which I love. <laughs> and it's interesting, like we make a plan. I always say this, you know, but then God has a different plan, right? You yeah. know, like, like you said, like you were trying to hold back and keep things private. And clearly you're on Anderson Cooper and like, like and my buddy Anderson. And yeah. I, no, I, that's, it, that's been the craziest thing is everyone's like, oh, you're so good at public speaking. You're so good at this. And, oh, you're just such a people person. But like, you know me and Lauren knows me. <laughs> like, that is the complete opposite <laughs> of who I typically am. But I feel like my mission right now and my mission before this happened was I wanted to help other families with kids who are medically complex because it is extremely lonely. It's extremely scary. And a lot of times all you have is Google and Google is your worst enemy and, but you're still going to do it. Um, so I really wanted to try and help as many medically complex families as I can. And now where we've unfortunately ended up, if I'm going to do anything, it's going to, I'm going to spend the rest of my life making sure um, somebody doesn't feel the way that I feel. Um, and I'm never going to not let people know who Jonathan is. 
Yeah. So I have forced myself to become more out there. And it's scary because for every good person and person that is positively affected by our story, I'm sure Lauren can vouch. There are a lot of hateful messages, a lot of COVID is a very hot topic, unfortunately, and people feel so inclined to attack me, my husband, and my family regularly. And so it's it's definitely scary and tough, but it's if I can help one person and one person is affected by our story, I'm going to keep doing it. So yeah. until people get really sick of me. <laughs> it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, the opinions are so – people are owning their opinions like like they have to share them. Like they just, they have to get this out of them. And it ends up being very judgmental. And, uh, yeah. and you're, good. No, go ahead. I, I was going to say, you're such a sensitive gal. Like you just are. I know your energy. Like I know your energy. Um, that it's hard to have that exterior armor up because you want to be with like you definitely want to move with energy and feel like that you're serving but haters are going to hate yeah and is that going to be the stopping point that's and it has been at some points um i had one woman um right when this first happened she went back on our facebook page to a video i had posted of Braden and penelope and Brayden and her are watching um, Sesame Street on his Kindle and Brayden leans down and puts his arm around her. And it was so sweet because, I mean, he was not very happy we added to the family. So for him to acknowledge her, and I love this video. And this woman went through and screenshotted different images and said that Brayden was a violent human being that should be institutionalized and Penelope was abused. And for me, that was, that at one point was a breaking point and I had to step away for a little bit because you can, I'm choosing to put myself out here. Um, if you want, and I've had people write me horrible, horrible messages, that's fine. But don't come after my kids and don't try to make my son or my daughter look anything less than amazing. But I've learned to at least with when it comes to me, let that roll off and learn that that comes with the territory. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely hard, especially when they say hurtful things about the kids. So or I get that I'm uh, the hoax thing a lot. And that's, that's, mm. that. I wish I was living a hoax. Trust me. I wish Jonathan was in Cabo San Lucas, like waiting for us. I, I wish it was yeah, right. fake. So if you, if you, um, you know, I, I think it's interesting, like, y you could be quiet, because that's your tendency to be very introverted and very closed off and very private. And you knew in the beginning, like when you had Braden, there was a message to be shared, because it would help somebody like that's the service part of you, right? Yeah. So the drive for you to share anything is always in that service. Like, what, what do you go through? I can imagine the, I can just imagine, I'm just going to ask you to the inner turmoil, like that you're going to go through in order to even write a blog or a post or, or be on a talk show like you have been, like, what does that inner turmoil look like for you? And how do you, how do you get to the resolve of like, yeah, God's asking me to do this? Yeah. Um, I, when I started Braden's Facebook page, Jonathan and I made had many discussions about it and the reason we decided to do it was when Braden first received his diagnosis there were no like Facebook groups that I could find I couldn't find any I didn't know where to look and I did find one little girl Emma her pages embrace life Emma and her mom was phenomenal and we still talk but she was very much helping me through this whole process and I remember how lonely and scared and secluded we felt. And I wanted to at least be one sort of voice for somebody else that if they searched a hashtag like we did or came across a friend of a friend who knew our page, that at least 
there was somebody who's like, okay, well, look what Brayden's doing. It's not all bad because that's the way I looked at Emma. I was like, look at the amazing things Emma's doing and her family. We're going to be okay. And when you're posting on Facebook, it's much different than you using your voice. And I've never been one to post videos of myself or do live videos, anything like that. And when Jonathan um, passed and the note went out, I wasn't really sure if I was going to do anything. Um, but then, uh, you know, when Anderson Cooper's people call, you pick up. So <laughs> it was just more of, I remember my friend, uh, Jacob, Jacob and Caitlin, I was on the phone with them and they said, Katie, listen, just do it. You have to, it's a lot to ask you, but you have to, somebody has to be a face and somebody has to put a voice to what I think it's, I'm not even sure what the count's up to now, but over 130,000 people have gone through. And I just, I, maybe it was part delirium, but the other part was like, you know what? somebody needs to speak for these people and I'm going to do it. So, I mean, and it sounds ridiculous. I feel like I sound ridiculous 90% of the time and like full of myself, which is the part that's the introvert, but I just want to help people. And if this is the way that I can do it, I'm going to do it. So even like I watched that interview and, and I, first off, I also know that you didn't pick up the phone for other people. Like you didn't always answer the phone right away. Like you, <laughs> yeah like you you were like wait wait what do I do and um and it was uncomfortable it was an uncomfortable space because you just lost your freaking husband and you couldn't have a funeral and you had to go to the hospital and you had to do things that were nobody should have to do yeah um yeah I I think I mean personally for me I'm almost thankful that we couldn't have had a funeral. Um, Jonathan wouldn't have wanted the kids and I there and being sad and he would have wanted us to try and be as okay as possible. But it, I don't even, it's one of those things where you have to feel like something was pushing me in this direction because it doesn't make sense because it is so out of my character. It is so just not something I would typically do. And I just sort of gave in and was like, okay, I'm going to do this. But I had no, absolutely no idea that it was going to turn into this. And I think it finally kicked in when like I had the producers from the Ellen show call me. And then I was like, whoa, this is really becoming something huge. And um, it, I just... I don't, it doesn't make sense because it's just not typically my MO of how to do things. So. Yeah. And your interview with Anderson Cooper, like, you know, clearly you're, you were grief stricken. You were still shaking. Like it was so raw and, yeah. and he's crying. He's crying. Yeah. I because so that was like a thing he didn't do. Like I obviously know who Anderson Cooper is. I've watched him. Um, but I didn't realize it was a huge thing for him to be as emotional. And I'm sure people who are watching can tell I get very awkward in uncomfortable situations. And so when he started tearing up, I was like trying to joke around and make light of it because I didn't know that that was a thing. And I, all of a sudden my uh, 15 year old sister was like, Katie, the people from Vanderpump Rules are posting about Anderson's interview with you. And I was like, whoa. And it just went insane from there. And, but he was so kind. He was so amazing, so nice. And he made it, made me feel okay with being vulnerable, especially with him being so vulnerable. And now you're here in this space, you know, it, it, and I think when Jonathan passed, it was like in that, it was definitely a raw time. I mean, we were all living in a place of uncertainty, unknowing, and um, it was just not, it was unknown. We didn't know. Yeah. And what do you think about, like, what is your opinion about the masks and 
the controversy and everything. I'm just curious on where you stand with us. I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I haven't been asked that before. Um, I wish Jonathan had been allowed to wear a mask. He had not been allowed to wear a mask. At that time, the CDC was saying to only wear a mask if you were um, sick or showing symptoms. Um, and I, his exposure to COVID to him getting very sick was so short. And anyone that knows Jonathan knows he, his, he was so afraid of getting sick. He the week prior to him being exposed had told me no more therapies for Brayden. My grandmother had been helping watch the kids so I could do rehab for my hand. He was like, you're not seeing your grandparents anymore. And I remember him saying, I'm not worried about them getting us sick. I'm worried about me getting them sick, which I thought was Jonathan just, he was very much a worrier always, but he was very adamant about this. And he, was so always even prior to COVID very hypervigilant about germs because of Braden. We always had to be because Braden got an ear infection and was in the hospital for two days. So he, when he gets sick, it levels him. Um, I think it doesn't take that much to care about the person next to you. I don't care if you don't care about yourself. That's fine. I at times don't care about myself, but you know what? I don't want to see another family see their husband or their father or their son the way that I saw my husband that morning. People don't understand that there's no treatment for COVID. It's not even about a vaccine. It's about knowing what to do when you get that sick. When you get that sick, you're not coming home most of the time. And people don't understand that. And Jonathan was a guinea pig and he didn't deserve that. And people don't understand if you can wear a mask to keep yourself from going through that, your family, your kids from going through that. Just, just do it. It's not that hard. I understand they're uncomfortable. I hate wearing masks, especially in the summer. It's awful, but it's, it's something that I know is going to help me stay here for my kids. And it's going to help the person next to me. God forbid I was asymptomatic and didn't know it. That's going to help that person not end up being where Jonathan was because Jonathan suffered for 28 days and he shouldn't have ha had to. And I feel like the controversy when it comes to COVID, I think we're being between the media, media and the politicians and all of this conspiracy theory stuff. I think we're being fed so many things that aren't really what's happening. And when it comes down to it, it's really just about families and protecting each other and caring about each other. And for some reason, us as we as humans can't do that anymore. And it's nobody doubts, nobody makes light of, nobody tries to justify when somebody passes away from cancer, when somebody passes away from an automobile accident, when you know what I mean? Like nobody tries to justify that or say, well, this person died because of this, or this person didn't really die because of that. And I live in a world where everyone's telling me that there are reasons why my husband died. And there are people telling me that my husband didn't die and telling me that I'm a sheep and that I'm part of a propaganda when it's really just about caring about each other. It doesn't matter who or what you believe in politically, spiritually, anything like that. It's about caring about everyone else. And we just seem to not be in a world that can do that right now. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a dangerous, uh, it's a dangerous space, right? Yeah, it's, it's, I don't, and I think, unless you're directly affected, I know that if, Jonathan had been even just lightly sick or had been asymptomatic, I probably would be brushing off a lot of the scary stuff that I hear about COVID because when it doesn't affect you, you don't know. But myself, our family, our friends, everyone who saw this and has seen what the kids and I are enduring now, um, it's not it's not something to be taken lightly and you shouldn't have to go through what we're going through in order to just take something seriously for a little bit. It's the quicker we get a handle on this, whether it's a treatment or just giving the doc, the nurses and everyone a break to kind of figure out this, the quicker we can get back to our lives and whatever that may be. And people just don't seem to want to do that.
and it's sad. And now you are having to not only, you know, deal with grief, but you also have to think about longevity with your son, you know, special needs about caring for him. And it's a 24 hour a day yeah. you know, thing. So, um, and working and how and what all that will look like, you know, who's going to care. Like it's all on your plate now. Like you can't juggle between, Jonathan and you, how you were doing it, tag teaming before. Yeah. We always said to each other, um, we wouldn't be able to do this without the other person. So it's a little bit of a adjustment. And I'm so thankful that I have Brayden and Penelope and I love being their mom. But it's, I think this is shaking up everything where it's not only learning how to parent on your own it's you have to start thinking about like what happens to them if something happens to me what ha- who takes care of Brayden and it's a whole world of scary things that um six months ago we would have never thought about and uh it's a lot and it's definitely I was always the most confident person as being Jonathan's wife and being Brayden and Penelope's mom And I don't have that anymore. Um, Not even being his wife, but as a mom, I feel like everything's kind of crumbled. And uh, I don't feel like I have my life together as I did six months ago. And that's really hard because I felt like I had a really good grasp on this the last three years. And it's just everything in my life is my world's been turned upside down and I don't really know which way is up. And it's, 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 something that I don't I'm still trying to navigate through and I'm not really sure how to do it yet but my um I have a dear friend who lost her husband um in December and we were having a conversation recently and she said you know so many people they keep saying like you make it look easy no no and like they stay on it and they don't kind of let it go and you look good and in and she's like I I just you know it's not that I want to live in a land of like this is horrible and you should join me. And I, I am struggling. And I said, what if you just said, thank you, but this is a lot of work, like showing up, like doing my, like praying and meditating all the things I have to do just to be here. And I appreciate you recognizing that. And she was like, I love that. That's like so super powerful. Instead of having to feel like you have to defend, like, wait, I I look good, but I'm broken. Yeah. I think my, one of my biggest things is, um, I don't even say that. I just, I don't really even say anything. Um, I will like once in a while open up and be honest, but uh, I feel like the moment I let anyone kind of know how bad it really is and how dark it gets, it's going to drown me. I think that's where your writing comes in. Like for me, like when you, are expressing yourself it doesn't get bottled up in you mm-hmm. and then people are so moved by your words like it just is such a powerful thing uh, and so I feel like obviously like we've kind of worked together on the side I do feel like that's where you're you're have been led and God is saying like come here come here keep going keep going does that fuel you does that fill you the writing Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And, um, yeah, it's definitely, uh, difficult because it does, uh, force me to be vulnerable. And that's really the only place where I'm on a constant basis vulnerable, but, um, it's, it's definitely an outlet and, uh, we are going to, it actually went live today, but I haven't, posted any of my content yet but uh I have start we've started a website and it's going to be a blog and a vlog that's going to piggyback off of our Facebook page with Brayden where that's really um I want to continue to use that to help to focus on Brayden and things like that and our family but the website will definitely be a way for me to hopefully use my voice, not only for myself, but for others to kind of get a more of an idea of what I'm going through. Because 
unfortunately, there's probably many, many, many other women or husbands or anyone who's gone through something similar. And I'm hoping that if I can allow myself to be more vulnerable, that it might kind of resonate with them. So it is, it's, but it's hard for me to let that part out because it's definitely, again, giving some of my privacy away, but also just forcing me to be human, which I'm not really good at being all the time. Well, you would, you don't have to do this, but there's something that's kind of leading you there. Yeah. Yeah. It, I don't know what it is, but it's definitely, I felt like this is what I'm supposed to do. And I do feel kind of, there's the self-conscious side of me that feels kind of ridiculous for thinking that I'm that important that people care what I have to say. But, um, for some, I just, I feel like it could do good. Uh, so Mm. I don't know why though. <laughs> it, it's funny. I talked about this in my first book, um, The Goddess You. It was the same thing. Like, uh, it wasn't about me or, or you know, that being vulnerable or telling the story wasn't about, like, I think I'm great, but it was those God nudges. It was, the, it was this quiet tone that was in me just saying, no, speak it, because it will make a difference. And so when I got out of the self-criticism, you know, just, like, kind of, like, I, it didn't, it didn't make sense to me, but I started to listen and trust mm-hmm. and follow. And one step led to the next and then one God nudge led to the next. But for me, like, that's where it's really important. It's, it is about divine. It is about this soul truth. This is, you know, purpose of, of supporting our soul and the work of other people. Like it's, it, it's not us. It's not you. Yeah. It's, that's one thing it's never none of this is about me and I mean I get sick of myself so but I feel um, don't we all like um but I I definitely if I feel as if I mean and I I go back to I I feel like who Jonathan was as a person overall he he doesn't seem real because he was such a good kind a really a pure human being and those types of people don't exist and I feel and I've had so many people reset reach out to me that have said like I would have never thought to write a note but I put one in my phone for my family and people being able to see that just being a good person you touch so many people's lives and I feel it's that's a huge part of the reason why I'm doing this is he, people deserve to not only be treated the way that Jonathan treated other people, but people should be the type of person that he was because I'm not even the type of person he was, but I, I want to strive to be that type of person. And that's probably, it's never been about me. It's always been about him and Brayden and Penny. And now it has to be about you, which is so interesting. Yeah, right. <laughs> God laughing. Yeah, right. Right. You've shared so much openly and I so I just like honor you and thank you for being brave. I don't like, feel it, but I appreciate yeah. it very much. I know. And I know it's not an easy space to be in. No, it's 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 not. It's, Is there a line from his letter that you hold on to, like uh, a part of it that you just um I think the one that's probably the easiest is like always be happy no matter what. Um, I honestly, and I've said this before um, to people, I hate the note. I hate it because I'm so thankful I have it, which is what's hard, but I hate it because it's a reminder of the mind frame he was in. Right. And I didn't know, and I wish he had told me, but it's also, I know that I would have never gotten it had he come home. So it's again, just another reminder that he's not here, but be always be happy no matter what is something that I talk to the kids about and um, we have in the kids' rooms and that's something that's really important that they, I want to instill in them. So that really sticks out the most to me. Yeah. 
it's really beautiful. Yeah. It's hor it's horrible. Um, sad, like my heart breaks for you, but then there's like these beautiful parts that just it's his it's his legacy. Yeah. It's what he left behind, which is love. Yeah. No, he Jonathan he loved I never doubted how much he loved me and he never made me feel anything less than loved and seeing him as a father it was the same thing. Um it just he was just the most loving human being and when he loved you he loved without any sort of restraint and there was no well I love you with this but not with this and he I mean he drove me crazy he you know as husbands and significant others do but he was honestly the most loving kind human being and never ever had anything negative to say about anybody ever and I was very, I am very lucky to be his wife. I hope that you're, I hope that you're seeing yourself in uh, the eyes of love as well. Like this is hard and everything that you're doing, you're showing up for your family. And I hope there's a gentleness and supportive tone that you're carrying within you. Um, I think I'll get there. <laughs> I know it's my hope for you. Yeah, no, it's, I think anyone that goes through grief to this degree, um, you're not always the most kind to yourself, but also um, just it, the whole situation as it was very chaotic. It was very, um, I wasn't able to be as involved as I would want to be. And it's hard to feel like, I had, this was my chance to do something right. And I know that I had no control over it, but it's, it's hard to uh, let myself really believe that I didn't have any control over it and that I did what was best for him. So I'll get there maybe one day, but um, you know, it's, it's so work in progress. Well, I'm going to still keep sending those positive messages and prayers I your way. <laughs> And I'll invite people on Facebook, like if you go and hang out with, with Katie on her Facebook page, you know, keep it upbeat, like send her some love, send her positive reminders. Yeah. Tell them, tell them exactly how to find you again. Sure. So um, our Facebook page is Journey for Brayden. And uh, it's also the same handle with a little underscore. It's Journey for Braden underscore on Instagram. But if you go through my our Facebook page, page there's some Instagram posts. So you'll be able to click on that. And our uh, website is coellojourney.com. And um, it's C-O-E-L-H-O journey.com. And that's going to be more of a personal blog video sort of thing that um, – is live now but i am working on my first kind of blog entry for that it will be slightly different so people that do follow brayden who are going to the website if you know me personally which Jeannie does um my sense of humor can be a little sarcastic so i'm writing more that way when i talk about my grief and my marriage and things like that so it is a little different but um I, I'm, I'm ha I, I, I don't really feel much, but the emotion that I would feel is I'm happy that we have all these things and we love the amount of support and that we've been receiving and how Braden has and Penny have this huge following and cheer squad. And for me, that's amazing to see. So. Oh, and also um, tonight's proceeds, anybody that bought a ticket to, to hang out with us after the, after the live feeds over, it's going to go to Scotty Fund, can you tell everybody a little bit about that too? Sure. So the Scotty Fund is a foundation that um, is started in the town of Bethel, the Anderson family. They are amazing. They lost their son, Scott, to cancer um, when he, I believe he was two or three years old. And they had received so many donations and outpouring from the community that when he did pass away, that they decided they wanted to help other families 
who um, have children with life-threatening illnesses or conditions. When we found out about Braden, I um, obviously was no longer able to work because Braden requires 24, he can't go to daycare because he's G-tube fed and his knee contractures. Um, and Jonathan and I were scared because we were, we had prepared and we had a good amount of savings, but eventually savings goes away and we weren't sure what we were going to do. And one day, um, Linda Anderson, who is Scott's mom and one of the, the founders of the Scotty fund called me and said, we're going to help you. You're only job is to make sure that you take care of Braden and the Scotty fund has, I mean, saved us in so many ways, whether it just be with groceries or they've helped us with some equipment for Braden that insurance didn't cover. And just a, they would call or show up with like a Christmas basket for the kids. And they've helped, I think it's over a million dollars have gone to families within the Fairfield County, Bethel, Danbury, region um and have they've just done amazing things and i'm so thankful for them and i would have never we would have never been able to make it without them so i'm glad we're able to give a little bit back to them yeah i'm, I'm happy about that too thanks guys for joining you know what i know because angels don't lie have a great night the truth. when she smiles at you she'll say